Hello, good evening, good evening all, uh, good evening Anand. Uh, Hi, uh, good evening, uh, Ningu Swami. Yes, yes, I'll, I'll begin the session in a while. So, uh, before I actually begin the session, Hello all, uh, good evening. So, uh, so let's uh, begin with the session. So before I actually begin with the session, so today we'll be dealing with uh, police reform. So let me uh, introduce myself. So this is my first session on the YouTube. Uh, so I've been educated at an academy for uh, more than two years now. And uh, so my name at the platform is Anish S. And uh, you can uh, follow me on the link unacademy.com uh, slash ANISH9008. Uh, or you can search me on the Unacademy Learning app, uh, Anish S. If you search, uh, you will find my name and you can follow me there to get all the updates on the uh, courses and the lessons, etc. that I'll be creating. And then I've already created a lot of uh, courses already. So you can uh, check out all those courses I have already created. Uh, uh, I hope you all have the Unacademy Learning app. So download uh, that and then just, uh, if you don't have, download that and just search for my name, Anish S. and uh, you will get me the, uh, there and then we can open my uh, profile page and check out all the courses that I've created. So I've created a lot of uh, courses, especially uh, relevant to prelims and so on. So I've created courses on modern Indian history, art and culture, uh, polity and so on, where I've covered all the uh, previous year's question papers of uh, last uh, 30 years or so. So that is going to be mentally uh, beneficial uh, uh, if you want to revisit all the question paper or if you uh, you have prepared studying and you just want to revise and so on. So those are going to be uh, very helpful. And then I've created a lot of other courses too. Then I take uh, special sessions on Unacademy Plus, and I've already uh, started a course on Unacademy uh, Plus uh, platform. So uh, that, that course is actually going on, and it's almost uh, by tomorrow will be the last day. And then I'll be uh, creating uh, more uh, new courses on the Unacademy uh, Plus platform too. So I would uh, suggest all you all to actually uh, prescribe, uh, go, uh, go subscribe the Unacademy Plus. So there are uh, one month, six month, and 12 month subscription. So I would suggest you to uh, subscribe somewhere around six months or 12 months because uh, many of the courses are actually uh, going on more than one month, two months, and so on. So uh, if you uh, get the Unacademy subscription for the UPSC, you can attend uh, any uh, plus courses on the Unacademy plus platform by any educator. So you have we have all the uh, good top educators on the Unacademy platform. So that is going to be immensely beneficial for your preparation. And I will also be taking a lot of uh, courses, especially uh, now that prelims is fast approaching. Uh, I'll be taking courses on the uh, prelims uh, perspective and so on. So I, I'll uh, help you with that regard. So uh, today's session, uh, yes, uh, all of you are waiting uh, to begin with the uh, uh, the today's session that is the uh, police reforms. So uh, so the introduction aside. So uh, shall I begin with the uh, session, uh, or do we need to wait a minute or two for? other people to join. So we have quite a few people already joined. So uh, shall we begin the police reforms? Oh yes, uh, uh, so uh, let's begin with the session. So uh, do interact with me, do uh, type out your reply and so on in the chat. Uh, so I ask whether I can actually begin with the session. So I don't see any response uh, beyond that. So uh, do keep interacting because I get to know what's happening and uh, whether you guys have understood and so on. Uh, so Biswati Swain has asked, can I get help on railway coaching in this channel? Yes, there are many other sessions and so on on, on the Unacademy platform also we have a lot of uh, uh, we have a lot of uh, 
courses that are dealing with the uh, railway, uh, various railway exams and so on. So uh, suggest, uh, I, I would suggest you to check out on the Unacademy Learning app on the various uh, courses on the railway. All right, so uh, let me begin with the uh, police reforms, uh, the uh, topic of the day. And uh, so my first question to you all is, uh, why do we need uh, police reform? So that is the question uh, to you all. So uh, those who are already there, uh, so let me see some of your opinions and uh, uh, you know, your views on why, why is police reforms important? Why do we need, or let's take India uh, case specific, uh, why do uh, India need uh, police reforms? So, uh, let me see some answers here. Yeah, uh, come on guys, uh, come on, what's, what's your uh, view? So why do you think uh, police reforms are important or why does, uh, why does India or any other country for that matter need police reforms? So uh, let me get some of your views. Uh, so let me understand what exactly you're thinking and so on. Then uh, we can proceed with uh, my views on why uh, police reforms are important and so on. All right, so uh, I'll wait for your answers and so on, and I'll also uh, begin with uh, the the need of police reform. So uh, when we're discussing a topic, obviously we need to do, uh, discuss it from a uh, comprehensive perspective. We need to see what the existing problems are. So that will give us the answer to why do we need police reforms and so on. And then obviously, what are the reforms uh, that have been done so far? And obviously, what more uh, reforms need to be taken uh, to take something forward. So this is the general structure of how you prepare on any uh, topic generally. So uh, with respect to police reforms, why do we need it? So one of the most important aspects is a good law. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, good law and order is critical factor uh, for any country for that matter, not just India, to ensure all right, to ensure that a country has good economic growth. Why? Because if the, the law and order situation in a country is good in, in, in a, okay, I, uh, do any of you have a problem with the sound? Uh, somebody has said that sound is not clear. So uh, if any else, anyone else is facing the problem with the voice, uh, do let me know. I'll uh, find out what the problem is. So law and order is one of the most critical factor for any country for its economic uh, growth. Because if there is strong law and order, if there is a rule of law, if there is a good implementation uh, of the law and order, then uh, the crimes etc will be very less the properties and the investments etc that people make um, will be uh, secured because let's say an industrialist is investing uh, a few crores or rupees and setting up a new factory or a new office or something if the law and order situation is bad and there is a threat of uh, constant attack and uh, attack by somebody on the uh, on the on the industries and so on and uh, rampaging and so on, if that is something that is going to frequently happen, then that investor will certainly uh, feel that uh, this is not a right place to invest because that investment will not be secure and so on. So uh, that is one aspect. So, uh, all right, uh, there's no problem with the sound. Good. Uh, so I think uh, somebody who had raised the issue, uh, do check your, uh, you know, your phone or your uh, voice plug and so on. All right. So uh, good law and order is uh, critical because that is going to ensure there is stability and there is peace and that is going to attract uh, more people to come in and look for the work there, uh, more industrialists and entrepreneurs etc to set up new businesses and so on there. Uh, so uh, if there is no good law and order then there will be issues of uh, normal crime or uh, terrorism and so on uh, could frequently affect that area and that area's economic prospect will be uh, seriously curtailed. So if you look at a recent uh, estimate about 9% of India's GDP uh, is being uh, we, we are losing almost 9% of our GDP annually uh, because of uh, various uh, problems such as you know crime, 
uh, terrorism, external threat, and so on. Whereas if you look at the comparable uh, figures for say, China and Japan, China loses only about 4% of GDP due to the crime and all those things, and Japan even less than 3 So a country with much uh, stronger law and order mechanism means the loss because of all this is very less. So this is so uh, a good law and order mechanism uh, can only be implemented with a modern police force, an advanced police force, and that can only come with police reforms. Then, uh, because of uh, issues in our say uh, police system and policing and so on, there is a rise in the number of private security agencies uh, that are functioning, and uh, all these if you see all these companies and uh, even the ATMs and so on, they are actually recruiting uh, private uh, security agencies to uh, secure those. Uh, you know, ATM machines and their office premises and so on. So if we had a much stronger policing system and so on, this would not be needed. This is basically an extra expenditure for that company and so on. So uh, if that, uh, if the policing etc. were better, then the, uh, the company could have chose to uh, spend that on uh, new uh, plans or something or basically creating new jobs uh, from a company's core point of view rather than spending it on the uh, private security and so on. And then uh, because of you know the current policy system, uh, there is a huge border, uh, burden on our police uh, personnel. So they are doing multiple things and there is a lot of burden on our state police and even center and so on because they are involved in VIP security uh, in say police like uh, in Chhattisgarh police or Jammu Kashmir police and so on. They are not just doing the normal policing activity of uh, crime prevention and investigation and so on. They are also actively a part of anti-insurgency operation and so on. Uh, so these are all... Uh, leading to heavy burden on the uh, police personnel. So only police reforms can help in uh, mitigating many of these problems. And then uh, the, today's uh, security challenges for all the country are extremely complex because uh, complex challenges such as terrorism, uh, cyber crime, uh, modern uh, crimes such as financial crimes, uh, all these are the modern sort of crimes that the uh, police actually is facing. And to actually tackle these type of crimes, then uh, the police have to be uh, modern and they have to uh, the, the police reform have to care they have to be very efficient they have to be good enough to tackle the modern challenges and only then can we ensure that uh, you know the country is secure and so on so uh, the economic uh, growth will be there and that is going to lead to betterment better life for the uh, people so uh, uh, the uh, the current NS, NSA national security advisor Ajit Doval had said that the uh, the wars in the past were fought in the borders and in the battlefield and so on. But today's war are going to be fought in the urban areas, in the towns, in the uh, cities and so on. So there, who is the first uh, line of defense? It is the police. So uh, so today's war, the fourth generation war and so on, uh, who will win the war and lose the war will be decided by the how good the police is. If the police wins the war, then the country will win the war. If the police loses, then the uh, country will lose. So, so that is the a reflection of the complex nature of the security challenges modern countries face. So what are the problems in the present policing system uh, that necessitates uh, police reform? One is that uh, current uh, police ratio, the police to citizen ratio is only about uh, 192 uh, police per 1 lakh of the Indian population. So that is a very uh, low ratio because globally recommended ratio is 220. Currently we have only 192 which is bad. And uh, the police act that the law that governs the police in the various states and so on is uh, by and large by the still the colonial act of 1961. Though, though some of the state, uh, states and so on have made some changes in the recent years, we will discuss those changes and so on uh, subsequently. Uh, but uh, so what is the problem with the colonial police act? Now first and foremost, the colonial ruler, the British government, the British Raj in India was to rule India, not to govern India. But today's uh, the political leadership and so on is to govern India. They are supposed to serve the people and not to rule the people. Whereas the British Raj, the colonial rule was supposed to rule the people. So their police was primarily designed to uh, suppress all the freedom movement and so on, suppress the Indian people. That was the prime aim of that police there. Basically to ensure the British Raj continues without any uh, hurdle. But today's police is to ensure that the people are safe, the people are served by the police, their security has to be taken care of. So today's police is supposed to serve the people, but in the 1861 Police Act was supposed to rule the police or suppress the people. That was the aim there. So this is a fundamental difference and that is why uh, the Police Act, the Colonial Police Act had to be replaced and uh, new modern Police Act had to be brought. And then until uh, late 2000, it was still the 1961 Police Act that was uh, actually uh, running the police affairs in India. But some changes have happened, but then still in case of attitude and so on, it is still the uh, colonial attitude that uh, many uh, police personnel and so on have. 
so uh, if you if you go back to the british uh, period so in 19 uh, not to uh, when lord curzon was the viceroy uh, a commission was a police commission was appointed that is asian uh, fraser commission so the fraser commission had uh, noted this the police force is far from efficient it is defective in training and organization it is in inadequately supervised and it is generally regarded as corrupt and oppressive it has utterly failed to secure the confidence and the cordial cooperation of the people so to some extent uh, this can be said about uh, today's police too but then today's police have significantly improved from the british raj police but some aspect of what it is said in this is applicable to today's police too so uh, if you look at the other aspect so uh, that ahl fraser uh, commission it also said this the police force throughout the country is in a most unsatisfactory condition that abuses are common everywhere and that this involves a greater injury to the people and discredit the government and that radical reforms are urgently necessary so this is what uh, ahl fraser commission again said so so the ahl uh, fraser commission observation to large extent is applicable to today's police force too and the wohra committee that was uh, appointed in uh, 1993 to look into the electoral uh, uh, the criminalization of politics that was what wohra committee was appointed to so when wohra committee studied all the issues it found that there is a strong nexus between the criminals the politicians uh, the bureaucrats and the uh, policemen so this bureaucrat criminal and the uh, police nexus is a, a serious problem and uh, this is something that the wohra committee in 1993 had noted and even today this can be uh, said to be uh, true because the nexus actually exists in many states and so on which is leading to inefficiency of the uh, police system and the police is not doing the job that it is uh, supposed to because of lack of reforms and the political control over the police is extremely high that freedom for the police to uh, uh, deliver their responsibility and so on does not exist and what are the other problems that exist in the uh, police system one there is lack of proper training and the uh, arms and the equipment etc used in many cases are still outdated for example if you remember the 2611 uh, attack of mumbai uh, the photos etc the the terrorist admiral kasab and so on were actually carrying uh, were, were carrying the ak47 rifles modern one whereas the uh, indian the maharashtra police constable like tukaram mumble and so on were carrying 0.302 world war era world war 2 era uh, rifles so uh, outdated now now only recently i think one year back or so on all the uh, 0.303 uh, uh, rifles were decommissioned and new weapons etc given but that shows how uh, slow are we in updating of the arms and ammunition and so on even the equipment etc are uh, quite backward even the police infrastructure as a result of that is lacking for example the cag uh, the comptroller and auditor general in their report they had noted that the uh, police communication uh, telecommunication network so this is the network that connects the various police station and so on and how the data is transmitted on crime is transmitted between the various police station and the states and so on so this polnet that that was actually uh, not functional in many of the states and uh, the housing shortage so the housing the uh, the quarters and so on for the police personnel are seriously uh, 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 they lack the, num- the number of uh, housing uh, the quarters and so on is limited it is not up to the level that is needed even the budget that is allotted to the police and so on is uh, not enough and then the manpower shortage so if we looked at all the state police services almost 24% of all the, uh, the there was 24% vacancy that is only 86% of the uh, approved vacancies were filled so there is serious uh, gap there and then also uh, 86% of the indian police is actually in the uh, constabulary uh, section it is not the officers and so on it is not the sub inspector and above it is actually the constable that make the 86% of the police which is uh, which is you know reducing the uh, promotion opportunity and so on so that leads to lack of confidence and lack of enthusiasm to do the job better and so on and the internal functioning of the police is not fair and transparent because you, you would have heard of a lot of issues such as uh, custodial death uh, police encounters and so on so such cases when it happened the internal investigation etc is not transparent and also the uh, internal transfer promotion etc is not transparent enough so corrupt police officers and so on and the police officers with a uh, political connection etc uh, get uh, promoted so this is a serious problem and then uh, all these problems of the police are eventually leading to lack of faith of the people in the police because uh, people actually fear in going to police station and so on police station is seen as some sort of an adversarial area 
and uh, many of the police complaints uh, baby custody death and so on are not registered and so on so because of this uh, the low uh, police accountability uh, is again eventually leading to lack of faith of the people in police so this is a serious issue when it comes to our low, overall uh, law and order situation so uh, we have discussed the problems so now we'll uh, discuss what are the reform efforts so far so if you have any doubts with respect to the need of uh, police reforms or what are the existing lacunae that exist in the uh, policing system then you can ask me right now and i'll ex explain any of the missing points again if not we'll move forward and i'll discuss what were the reform efforts that have been undertaken so far so i'll wait for a minute i'll see uh, for uh, if any of you are actually commenting so uh, kailash yadav is asking aap kaun se exam ki video upload karte ho except upsc so mai sirf upsc ke liye taiyari wagaira kiye the aur mujhe sirf upsc ke bare mein zyada pata hai to mera sara koshish upsc exam ke basis pe hi hai aur ye video wagaira upsc ke liye hai lekin kuch courses aise hote hain ki mainly upsc ke liye kiya jata hai lekin baki exam jaise ki ssc ho ya capf ka ho jo bhi upsc बाकी सिविल सर्विस एग्जामिनेशन के अलावा बाकी एग्जामिनेशन भी करते हैं तो उसके लिए भी थोड़ा बहुत बेनिफिशियल होता है एसएससी वगैरह को भी बेनिफिशियल होता है लेकिन मेनली मैं यूपीएससी सीएससी परस्पेक्टिव में ही कोशिश करता हूं लेकिन बाकी एग्जाम के लिए थोड़ा बहुत बेनिफिशियल होता है वो देखना पड़ेगा कि कौन सा कोर्स है क्या हो रहा है वगैरह सो आई डोंट सी एनी डाउट्स कमिंग इन विथ रिस्पेक्ट टू दी नीड फॉर पुलिस रिफॉर्म्स एंड द प्रॉब्लम दैट एग्जिस्ट इन दी पुलिस रिफॉर्म्स so uh, i'll continue with the reform efforts uh, that have been done uh, so far so historically i'll continue uh, so one of the uh, after independence one of the most important committee that is the first most important committee that was appointed which dealt with the subject of police reforms is the gore committee on uh, police training and it was appointed in 1971 so the committee uh, actually functioned for two years uh, looking into various aspects and so on but it was primarily the primary mandate was to uh, look into the the primary uh, mandate was to look into the uh, police training so uh, so the uh, mandate of the committee was to review the training of the entire police from the state police from the uh, constable level to all the way to uh, ips level officers level and then uh, the committee obviously went into all these thing and made uh, many recommendations and then eventually um, the uh, recommendations were made and uh, the recommendation that were per, uh, pertain into the police training and how to improve the police training and so on those recommendations were implemented uh, but the other reforms with respect to changing of some aspect with respect to policing and so on were not implemented so uh, this gore committee's reforms entirely were not implemented only the one pertaining to police training were uh, implemented then after the gore committee uh, another uh, next most important committee is the uh, national police commission so national police commission is one of the uh, most important Uh, commission or the committee that have been appointed uh, in, uh, in to look into the uh, police reforms so the national uh, police commission it was appointed in uh, 1970 uh, 79 and it, it functioned for 3 years 79 to uh, 81 actually uh, it, it was actually appointed in uh, 77 and from uh, 1979 to 1981 it started giving out its reports and so on so this was one of the most important one. so uh, what was the purpose of this national police commission the national police commission was given the mandate to uh, report on the various aspects of the policing and so on and suggest recommendations to reform the policing system so this commission observed that the, uh, the obviously because the radical police reforms were required because we had become independent and uh, almost uh, 20 or almost 30 years uh, had uh, passed after becoming independent so we had not made any changes and so on so because of the change in the political social and economic situation of the country after you know almost 30 years had passed after independence so obviously the police also had to be reformed accordingly and that was the prime mandate that was given to the national police commission and it submitted almost eight uh, detailed reports with respect to various uh, recommendations and various reforms etc that had to be done uh, and along with the uh, reports it also uh, drafted a model police act so this model police act was also uh, given to uh the uh the government uh, so this model police wa act was supposed to replace the 1861 colon because uh, even in 1980 it was the 1861 colonial police act that was still 
uh, governing the police in many states and so on. So obviously that is a that not a good law for an independent India. That is why a modern police act was tra- drafted and was given. And it was expected that this modern police act would be passed and a lot of reform aspects would be recommended. Uh, recommendation would be implemented. But unfortunately, none of the recommendations were. So, sorry guys, uh, there was some uh, interruption there. So, uh, yeah, so uh, let's continue. So, uh, we had stopped at discussing the National uh, Police Commission uh, recommendation and then uh, none of the National Police Commission uh, recommendations were uh, actually uh, implemented. And then, uh, so this was in 1981 that the recommendations uh, came. So uh, after this, uh, in 1996, there was a public interest litigation uh, that was uh, filed by uh, two DGPs, uh, former DGPs, retired uh, N.K. Singh and uh, Prakash Singh. So these two uh, DGPs actually filed a, a petition, PIL in 1996. Now, why did they file? Because in 1981 itself, all the recommendations by the National Police Commission had done. And then for almost uh, 20, 26 years, no action was taken by any of the uh, government on the uh, any of the reforms. So this uh, was, uh, you know, uh, this was what was challenged in that PIL that uh, no states have taken any, uh, any implemented any re- recommendation. So that is, that, that is what this PIL was basically uh, hinting at and then PIL wanted the Supreme Court to direct to the various state governments and the central government to implement the National Police Commission recommendation. So uh, the, uh, the court started hearing this case from 1996 and then uh, in 1998 the court uh, after uh, some hearing and so on it set up the Julio Ribeiro Committee on Police Reform. So Julio Ribeiro is a former uh, DGP, uh, former IPS officer. Uh, most of you would know. I think he was uh, Mumbai Police Commissioner and so on. So Julio Ribeiro, and he was also uh, he was also dealing with the Punjab insurance, insurgency and so on, uh, along with the KPS Gill. So uh, Julio Ribeiro committee was appointed by the Supreme Court, not by the government and so on. So the National Police Commission, Gore Committee, etc., were appointed by the uh, government. But Julio Ribeiro committee, in pursuance of this PIL, was appointed by the uh, Supreme Court. So Julio Ribeiro committee uh, proposed five major recommendations with respect to the state security and the selection of DGP and the complaints against uh, how to deal with the complaints against the various police and so on. But none of those recommendations were implemented. Those were submitted to the Supreme Court and the case was still going on in the Supreme Court. But then uh, it was not uh, implemented by the government and so on. Though it was not actually, actually submitted to the government, the report the report was given to the Supreme Court. But then uh, even though Supreme Court, uh, even though there was option for the various state government to implement it, they did not implement. Then some more committees were appointed by the government. One was uh, in 2000, uh, the Union Home Ministry appointed the Patmanabhaya Committee on Police Reform. So this committee inspected on various aspects of policing such as uh, recruitment, training, duties and responsibilities, behavior of the police officers, their investigation, uh, prosecution, etc. were looked into and uh, uh, 99 uh, actionable recommendations were given and uh, of those, uh, 59 of them had to be implemented by the central government and 69 by the state government. Uh, why more for the state government? Because uh, law and order and police are two subjects actually under the state government. So if you see the seventh schedule of the Indian constitution, police and the law, uh, law and order, both these subjects are under the state government. And obviously, uh, as usual, like none of the committee recommendations so far were implemented, even Padmanabhaya committee recommendation also was not implemented. Then in 2003, uh, another committee was appointed, but this was not uh, specific to the police reform. This was to look into the criminal justice system as a whole. So criminal justice system has police as one of the elements of it and there are courts and other elements are also there in the criminal justice system. So to look into the criminal justice as a whole, uh, 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 committee was appointed headed by a former chief, uh, retired chief justice of uh, a high court, uh, Justice uh, V.S. Malimut. 
So that is known as the Malimath Committee on the Criminal Justice Reform. So Malimath Committee was appointed by the government. This was for the entire criminal justice system, not exclusive to the police. But then since police are also a part of the criminal justice system, th there were some recommendations pertaining to the uh, police too. So Malimath Committee uh, looked into various aspects and so on. They also uh, gave a lot of recommendations. Uh, with respect to the, how the judiciary should be reformed, how the investigation, prosecution, etc. should be done, with respect to the various laws that exist, uh, crime, punishment, and so on. Of these, obviously, some of the uh, recommendations were pertaining to uh, the uh, police and how the police should be reformed, and so on. But uh, these uh, recommendations also were not actually implemented properly. And though, again, this also is not an exclusive police reform one, this is a larger criminal justice one. Some uh, criminal justice related recommendations were implemented here and there, but uh, uh, some uh, were recommended, uh, implemented here and there, but then overall no significant change happened. So uh, let me recap you. So 1996 a PAL was filed, that hearing on the PAL is still going on, right? That the verdict on that PAL still has not come out. So these are all initiatives that is again pa happening parallel by the government and so on. Only the Julio Rivera committee was appointed by the Supreme Court. But the Malimath Committee and the, uh, the Padmanabaya Committee all are appointed by the Union Home Ministry. Then finally in 2005, another committee is appointed. This is also a very important committee. That is the Police Act Drafting Committee. So uh, let me again take you back. In, 19, uh, in 1981, the National Police Commission had given out a model Police Act and so on. It was not implemented. But in 2005, again, a new Police Act Drafting Committee was appointed headed by uh, Soli Sorabji. So this committee is also known as a Police Act Drafting Committee or also as the Soli Sorabji Committee. Soli Sorabji is the former uh, Attorney General uh, of India and so on, a very eminent jurist. So Soli Sorabji headed this committee and uh, he, uh, the committee actually brought out a very good new model police uh, bill to replace the existing act. So existing act is still the 1861 Police Act, the British Raj Colonial Act. Uh, which is obviously bad. So that had to be replaced and obviously a model police bill again was uh, given but this obviously this police bill also was not uh, it was not made into act. It was not passed by the uh, parliament or the state legislature and the uh, Prakash Singh uh, case is still going on and the Prakash Singh's uh, case main argument was that uh, the uh, National Police Commission recommendations were not implemented. So uh, that was not implemented. 1996 the PIL comes and then after PA, a lot of committees and so on come and nothing is implemented. Now make sure you remember all these names and so on because if there is a question on uh, police reforms, then all these are going to be very handy for you. So this is, I'm giving, I'm, tra I'm tracing the entire history of the uh, police reforms. And police reforms itself is an important topic for this year because in 2018, a lot of uh, judicial verdicts exactly had come, especially on the appointment of the DGP and so on. So uh, very little was uh, done on the ground uh, so far. And uh, this uh, 2005, the police, uh, the Solis Arabic Committee brings out the model police bill. And the very next year, in 2006, finally, the Supreme Court delivers its verdict on the uh, Prakash Singh case, that the, the, uh, the PIL, that the uh, Prakash Singh and uh, uh, Prakash Singh and uh, N.K. Singh had filed that PIL. So finally, that verdict on that PIL comes. So here, the Supreme Court says that. Uh, Supreme Court basically gives out the verdict and this case is what is known as the famous case that is the Union of India versus Prakash Singh case. So this is the case that you keep, the Prakash Singh case, Prakash Singh case that you keep hearing is this particular case. So what did uh, Supreme Court say in this? The Supreme Court ordered that the police reform must take place and uh, the states and the union territories were ordered and also the central government. So union territories means it is the central government because uh, the police and so on under the various uh, union territories are actually under the union home ministry. So the state government and the central government were asked to comply with the seven binding directives of the Supreme Court. So as a part of this uh, verdict, uh, so, uh, that Prakash Singh verdict, Supreme Court had given out seven binding verdicts. And these binding verdicts, uh, obviously, uh, the content of these verdicts impl uh, included all the aspects. Uh, it was pulled together after the various aspects that were uh, there since 1979 on. That is, the National Police Commission recommendation, the Julio Ribeiro recommendation, uh, the Padmanabaya Committee recommendation, the Police Action uh, Drafting Committee, all these were taken in, considered and eventually seven binding directives were made by the uh, Supreme Court and it ordered all the state governments and also the uh, Union Territories, which is basically the central government, to implement these seven binding verdicts. So any doubts so far? If you have any doubts, you can ask. 
Uh, I'm looking at the chat and uh, I don't see any doubt coming in. So uh, do ask me any doubt and I'll answer them. So now let's, uh, if there is any doubt, I'll pause and I'll uh, talk about that. Otherwise, I'll continue with the session. So what are the seven directives that the Supreme Court put out in the uh, Prakash Singh verdict? Firstly, uh, it, it asks to constitute a state security commission, uh, commission. So this is for the state government. So all the state governments were asked to constitute a state security commission. So what is the state security commission going to do? It is going to enforce, it is going to ensure that the state government does not exercise unwarranted influence or pressure on the force. So this is basically giving a lot of independence to the police. Obviously, some influence should certainly be there because uh, at the end of the day, the state government is elected by the people. So uh, that people's uh, support to that government is something uh, that should be there. But uh, excessive influence means that politicization of the police force and uh, a lot of corruption, all these are coming because of the excess influence and lack of independence and so on is a serious problem. So that, so the good things were kept. That is, some amount of influence and control of the state government is there on the police, but uh, a large amount of it is taken away and given to the state security commission. So there is an independent oversight and uh, looking into the police functioning and so on. And the state security commission will also lay down the broad policy guideline with respect to the policing and so on in the state. And it is also going to evaluate the performance of the state police and suggest recommendations to improve their performance and so on. So uh, a, a, a supreme body called state security commission was to be appointed by the state government. Similarly, at the national level, a national security commission also had to be appointed. That is the dir directive too. So this national security commission, what is it going to take care of? So you see, police are there in the state, but at the central level also there is police. That is the uh, central police organization and the uh, the CAPF, the, the BSF, SSP, the CISF, CRPF and so on. So these are all police forces under the center. So uh, with respect to appointment of these, uh, uh, the chiefs of these, uh, Central Police Organization, your CBI and all of that. So CBI, there is another, uh, the local Act uh, in dealing with it. Uh, and uh, other uh, Bureau of Police Research Development and so on. So these are Central Police Organization under the uh, cent na uh, Central Government. So that is why National Security Commission is needed to uh, look into, uh, to make sure the appointment of the uh, chiefs of the various CAPFs and so on are done in an independent and fair and transparent manner. And this is the second recommendation. Third rec uh, not recommendation, directives, binding directives. So first directive is State Security Commission, second is National Security Commission, and third is to ensure, third was with respect to appointment of DGP. So this uh, court said that the uh, DGP should be appointed on a merit-based transparent process, and the DGP appointed should have minimum of two years. So you cannot appoint somebody uh, who has only one year. So uh, senior IPS officers will be appointed. So if that IPS officer has only one year left in the service, and if he's appointed DGP, it is wrong. It should be such that, that uh, whoever is going to be appointed a DGP should be able to uh, at least discharge his duties as DGP for two years. So minimum tenure is given. So somebody with at least two years of service left should be appointed. Along with that, two years also means that once you are appointed, once the state government appoints a DGP, uh, that DGP cannot be removed uh, before uh, you know the two-year tenure is over, unless and until in some sort of exceptional circumstances, uh, if it is. Then uh, it also, uh, the so these are the three directives. What is the fourth directive? Uh, it also said that the police officers in charge of operational duties. So who are the police officers in charge of operational duties? You have the IG, that is the inspector general, who is in charge of a particular range. And uh, that so at the state level, it is DGP. So DGP already have two year tenure as per the third directive. The next at the range level, it is the IG uh, who should be given. So IG of the range should be given at least two years of uh, tenure, uh, minimum tenure. So all the operational duties. So IG of the range. And then uh, district level head is the uh, superintendent of police and then the uh, station house in charge at the police station level. So and the circle inspector and so on. So your IG who is in charge of a range, your SP who is in charge of a, a district and your uh, SHO who is in charge of a police station. All of these are operational uh, officers, that is police officers with operational responsibilities. So all of them also should have minimum two year tenure. So one they are appointed as a SP of district and so on, minimum two year uh, they should continue, they cannot be removed uh, before that. So this is the fourth directive. And then it also ordered that the law and order and the investigation functions of the police should be uh, separated. So what are the difference uh, there? So investigation is basically a crime happens and so on, investigation is that. And law and order is to ensure there is peace, calm, uh, when it, if there is some sort of violence and strike or riot or something, then that law and order responsibility is discharged. So the, uh, there should be separation between law and order and responsibility because 
the sort of uh, skills needed and uh, ability and etc is different for these sort of functioning because uh, investigation is more of a very technical thing you know you need to be good in forensics and so on whereas in law and order you need to be better in managing crowd uh, and all those things so skills etc are different and the burdening of the police is uh, too much so if you are separating them both these functioning that is investigation will be done more efficiently because there is a separate investigation arm for the police and the law and order functioning of the police also will be done efficiently because there is a separate law and order and the police officers can you know be trained and and you know be expertized in one of these and so on so this is the fifth uh, directive sixth directive was that a police establishment board should be uh, appointed uh, it should be instituted and this police establishment board is what is going to decide on the transfers promotion postings etc of the uh, police officers of uh, below the ranks of uh, dysp and also make recommendations of the uh, police uh, of the ranks above uh, dysp and so on so police establishment board this is at the state level so each state has to appoint a police establishment board so this is again making the uh, promotions and so on transparent so as to uh, increase the independence of the uh, police so uh, six directives discussed so far what is the first directive uh, you can write in different order if you want but the first was state security commission then national security commission and then uh, separation of the investig uh, uh, sorry uh, then giving two year tenure to the dgp of police that is the state police chief and then giving two year uh, tenure to the operational officers so ig of range uh, district uh, police sp and the uh, sho in charge uh, giving them uh, uh, minimum two year tenure and then separation of investigation and uh, the law and order functions of the police and then finally uh, not finally uh, penultimately uh, uh, the appointment of the police establishment board which will decide on the transfers and so on and then finally Uh, the seventh directive is that a police complaints authority should be there at the state level to enquire into various complaints for uh, on the complaints on officers of rank of deputy superintendent of police and above uh, when it comes to uh, various issue whether it is misconduct uh, corruption or uh, custodial death or uh, grievous uh, hurt or uh, grievous crime such as rape and so on so in any of these uh, complaints with respect to any officers who is dysp or above it should be filed at the police complaint authority and for the police officers below the rank of dysp there should be a uh, again a district level complaints uh, authority so at the state level you have one authority dealing with all the complaints of all the police officers uh, dysp and above at the district level uh, you will have to have a police complaint authority to look into the police complaints against uh, officers and constables and so on below the rank of dysp so these are the seven directives of the Uh, supreme court in the uh, prakashing body so if these are implemented there is a significant level of a uh, police reform that would actually uh, happen so uh, what are the uh, so a summary of the seven directives again uh, quick recap first is state security commission then national security commission uh, transparent selection of dgp and minimum tenure for dgp then minimum tenure for the operational officers such as ig of the zones and ranges and all the officers uh, of the uh, sp of the district and uh, circle inspector and the uh, sho of uh, the station house in charge and then separating of the law and order uh, routine law and order mechanism and the investigation duties of the police and then uh, forming a police establishment board to into transfer and so on police complaints authority at the state level for dysp and above and the district level for the ones below the rank of dysp so these are uh, very good recommendation that are given by the prakash singh body and this was given in 2006 so how has this implementation been now supreme court itself has uh, found that its uh, recommendations have not been complied with in letter and spirit so many states and so on have made some changes in, uh, brought in new laws and so on and made uh, made some changes changes in the existing act and so on but none of these uh, actually just a moment yeah so none of these uh, actually implement this uh, supreme court uh, directives in letter and spirit because many of those actually changes that the Uh, various states brought etc is circumventing this and instituting and so for example they might have appointed a, a state security commission but the members of the state security commission etc uh, is politically motivated and appointed so as to dilute the powers of the state security commission and so on so by and large it is uh, the orders uh, implemented how if, if it is implemented it has been implemented in a dilute manner and some places it is not even implemented so only 17 states are actually enacted new laws and of that also many of them is not implemented or uh, in a very diluted form when compared to the seven directives of the directives of the supreme court 
So uh, because of that, in 2008, that is two years after this verdict, a three-member monitoring committee was appointed by the uh, Supreme Court to look into uh, the implementation of this Prakash Singh uh, Seven Directive. So the Supreme Court had given Seven Directive. The Supreme Court now, after two years after the, this thing, it, it appointed a uh, committee headed by uh, retired Justice K T Thomas. So he was heading the committee. Now this committee was interested by the Supreme Court to look into how this directives of the Supreme Court in the Prakash Singh verdict have been implemented. And the committee obviously expressed a sense of dismay over the indifference to the judicial direction. Basically, it means that the implementation has not been good. It has been quite lacklustre. In some cases, uh, it has gone against the Supreme Court directive. And then the Justice Varma Committee that was appointed, this had nothing to do with the police reform assets. This was actually, Justice Varma Committee was actually appointed after the Nirbhaya incident to look into the uh, criminal laws and so on. So uh, Justice Varma Committee also observed that if the Supreme Court directions in the Prakash Singh verdicts are implemented, there will be crucial modernization of the police uh, to be a service oriented uh, for citizenry in a manner which is efficient, scientific and consistent with human dignity. This is a brilliant quote that you can use if at all a, a question on uh, police reform comes. So you can quote the Varma Committee and uh, you can write about Prakash Singh verdict and say uh, Justice Varma Committee had uh, you know, said about the Prakash Singh uh, verdict directives in, as the that is. I, uh, so, very uh, brilliant quote which you can use in their answers and so on. So, uh, so that is what has happened until last year. So that is the status of last year. That is, many states have not implemented. Some states have diluted and so on, and nothing much has happened. So now, uh, what has happened after this is, in the last year, uh, quite a few uh, last and last to last year, actually last two three years, quite a few uh, you know movements have happened from a judicial uh, point of view itself on the. On the uh, on this uh, police uh, reforms and so on. So, what is one thing that is uh, the T P Senkumar case? Now, this is uh, I think this is some three year old or four year old case or so on. I think this was in 2017, 17 if I'm not wrong. Yeah, I, I, this this case was in 2017 or so. So, uh, the two I think it's a two year old case. Yeah, 2017. So, uh, who is T P Senkumar? Now, T.P. Senkumar was a former DGP of Kerala. That is, he was the former state police chief of Kerala. Now, uh, he was appointed by uh, uh, the government. And then in 2016, election happened. And a new government, uh, old go government, the old party was the Congress, the UPA, uh, not the UPA, UDF was voted out of power. And the left LDF came to power. And obviously, T.P. Senkumar had minimum two years there. So, he was continuing. And T.P. Senkumar was the DGP too. But uh, over the course of a few months, there was serious differences between this uh, police officer and the government and so on. And the, what the government did was, government removed, arbitrarily removed the uh, Mr. T.P. Senkumar from the post of DGP. So what did T.P. Senkumar do? He went to the Supreme Court and uh, filed a case saying that it is in violation of the Prakash Singh verdict and so on because minimum two year tenure is there and his removal was arbitrary and was not, there was a Kerala Police Act uh, which had, uh, you know, which had passed a uh, few years back. So it was even in the violation of the Kerala Police Act. So that was what the uh, T. P. Senkumar uh, argued in the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court actually upheld uh, T. P. Senkumar's, uh, you know, uh, version of things. And then uh, Supreme Court reinstated uh, T. P. Senkumar as the G. D. P. as the D. G. P. of the Kerala Police. And then T. P. Senkumar actually served a few months as the D. G. P. after that verdict, and then he eventually uh, retired after this. Uh, superannuation. So uh, this is again a, a big uh, verdict because uh, it showed that the removal of DGP and so on can only be in a uh, process as established by the law. If it is arbitrary, obviously you can quote the TP Kumar case and so on and then uh, get uh, it reinstated. Then last year another important uh, change happened that was a PAL again was filed on the non-implementation of the Prakash Singh verdict. Now look at the irony here. The Prakash Singh verdict was on the, it was a PAL for non-implementation of the National Police Commission reforms. And now you have a PAL on that uh, verdict of Prakash Singh saying that the Prakash Singh verdict has not been implemented properly, that the direct seven directors of the Supreme Court has not been implemented properly and a PAL was uh, filed. Which is actually true, the uh, contention of the PAL actually true. Now in that, the Supreme Court last year gave out a following ruling. So this was again very significant and it uh, brought in a lot of uh, change and so on. So uh, what are the uh, important rulings of the uh, Supreme Court in the 
a PAL on the uh, non implementation of the uh, Prakash Singh verdict. First, it, it, it again reiterated about the DGP appointment. So, on, obviously, you have a directive on the DGP tenure and the appointment in the Prakash Singh verdict also. And then TP Sen Kumar case was already done. And then, uh, in all this context, the Supreme Court said that the DGP has to be appointed in a manner as it said in the Prakash Singh verdict. So, what is the manner? The states have to uh, send the three uh, the names of the senior most police officers who are eligible to be uh, promoted uh, as D, uh, to DGP to the UPSC. That is, among the senior most IPS officers who are eligible to be promoted as DGP, they who are, who are eligible to be appointed as DGP, uh, who are in either a DGP rank or ADGP rank, who can be appointed as a state police chief, they, their names should be sent to the Union Public Service Commission. So states will have to send the names to the Union Public Service Commission three months in advance. That is, if there is a uh, DGP who is about to retire in three months, before three months itself, before three months of that uh, position becoming vacant, the probable candidate list of all the senior officers who can be appointed DGP, all the names should be sent to the Union Public Service Commission. Union Public Service Commission uh, will look into all these names and prepare a list uh, based on the uh, various criteria such as how good their performance have been and how many years of tenure is left there and their, uh, have they indulged in corruption, all these things will be looked into and UPSC and UPSC will eventually appoint, uh, you, you sorry, UB, UPSC will uh, shortlist three from the names. So let's say states have sent uh, five names, that is the five senior IPS officers are uh, eligible to be appointed as a DGP. That will be sent to the UPSC. Of that, uh, UPSC will look into all these things as the uh, Prakash Singh verdict had said, uh, based on the various criteria and so on. And then of that, three top names will be shortlisted who are the most suitable uh, to be appointed as the uh, DGP, that is the state police chief. So they will look into how many years are left and uh, how uh, have they been clean, that is corruption free, have they done their uh, duties properly when they were SP, when they are IG and so on, when they had operational responsibilities, how have they delivered their uh, discharge of the duties and so on. All these will look, all these will be looked into and three names will be uh, taken from that list of the state, uh, shortlisted and then UPSC will send that three names back to the state. So state is going to send all the eligible officers to the UPSC. UPSC based on these set criteria will select the three best ones and then send those three names to the state government. Now the state government is free to appoint any one of these three names that has been sent as DGP. So in these three names, the state government has complete freedom, but it can only appoint from, from these three names. Then a lot of state governments were actually appointing acting DGP. Because if you have to appoint DGP, then the uh, Prakash Singh verdict, the directive was uh, there because minimum tenure and so on had to be given. So they used to appoint acting DGP on a short term basis and so on in order to ensure that they have their control on that uh, DGP uh, position. Uh, basically that whoever is appointed a DGP will, uh, you know, will sway to the way that the state government want the politicization of the police and so on. So uh, this was something that Supreme Court did not want. So the Supreme Court clearly said no more appointment of acting DGP, only permanent DGPs can be appointed. So that means you appoint minimum two year tenure should be there. And then how you are appointing this process of sending this to UPSC and so on should be there. No more acting DGP because if you are appointing acting DGP, all these recommendation doesn't matter. So uh, it's not, but then some exception has been given uh, to some states such as Jammu Kashmir and so on because of some urgency and so on for to appoint acting DGP, but then that is on ad hoc basis. But the nominal uh, directive is that no more acting DGP. And then, uh, the, as I said, the person appointed as DGP should have reasonable period, that is, should have at least two years of service left. Uh, be, uh, so that means you, he, he is somebody who should not be retiring one year down the line, at least two years service, but otherwise it will be violation of the fracasting verdict. And then, as I said, the UPSC, how are they going to shortlist the person? They are going to, as far as uh, possible, they are going to uh, ensure there is at least clear two years of service and then merit and seniority etc is going to be taken care of and then the quality of the officers all these are going to be looked into when UPSC actually shortlist the three names from the list that has been sent by the state government. And then finally in that uh, PIL Supreme Court made a very important observation that, uh, or gave a very important ruling that is any legislation or a rule that has been framed by the any states or the central government running counter to the direction that they have issued in that particular PL, that is in the PL of non-implementation protection verdict, that is in 2008, whatever they have said in that ruling, 
any legislation of rule uh, running counter to what they have said in that uh, 2008 2018 not 2008 2018 that will that shall remain in abeyance so if uh, law and rule etc was there in place before or it has been newly instituted it doesn't matter it will uh, be it will remain abeyance that means it will not it will not be implementable because uh, supreme court said so so it is the supreme court what it said on dgp appointment and so on what is ruling the rule so this is what is the present status of the uh, police reform so the, because of these recent development especially the pal on non implementation of the prakashing verdict that is why this becomes a very important topic for uh, this year uh, even in uh, prelims and especially in mains so i hope uh, i have been uh, quite clear and uh, i have explained the police reforms the history of it and what's happened in the uh, recent 1 2 3 years especially the judicial verdict and so on so i hope it is uh, quite clear uh, to you all so if you have any doubts and so on you can ask uh, i'll be glad to answer them otherwise if you have any app uh, if you have any doubt you can uh, uh, send me uh, your doubts via the unacademy app and so on and then you can follow me on the unacademy uh, learning app uh, or on the unacademy website uh, uh, search for me my name is anish s at the platform uh, you can uh, follow me there and get updates on all the courses and so on i have created and then uh, you can see the uh, various courses and so on and then uh, that i have created and if you have any doubt and so on there you can comment uh, below that video itself Uh, what your doubt is, what your question is, and so on, and I'll be answering it uh, in a fast manner. So uh, I again would suggest all you all to uh, subscribe to the Arn Academy Plus, uh, take a six month subscription or so on, based on your convenience, and then you can use this referral code uh, A N I S H nine zero zero eight A is capital. So Anish nine zero zero eight is the referral code that you can use uh, to get a ten percent discount on your uh, subscription fee. So I hope you will take the Arn Academy Plus subscription and. Uh, watch uh, my plus courses as well as of the other uh, top uh, educators. So that's all. If you have any doubts and so on, you can uh, approach me via the An Academy app, or uh, you can comment below the various videos etc. that I have made on uh, pertaining to those and so on. So that's all. Uh, thank you all for watching, and uh, I hope you all have a great day. Uh, bye bye. Good night.